Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to the study talk today. Our speaker will be Janice Bishop. Uh, Janice was educated at Stanford University and Brown University, and then she did some postdoctoral work in Germany before coming here to uh, NASA Ames and the SETI Institute, where she's had a great career um, and continues. Uh, she uh, got a award in the past year from the Clay Mineral Society, uh, the Jackson Prize for Outstanding Work by a Mid-Career Scientist. And she will be uh, talking to us today about the same material she uh, presented for her prize lecture, Clays on Mars, How We Found Them, and Why They're Important for Astrobiology. So let's welcome Janice Bishop. Thank you. And let's see if I can get the audiovisuals right. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of clays or phyllosilicates on Mars because it's been a little bit contentious. And then the missions and the instruments that we use for detecting these, as well as characterization of the clay minerals using the spectroscopic techniques, basically how we find them with these techniques. And then global detection, so where are they on the planet? And then we'll look in detail at one site called Marth Vallis. So looking at the history, we started identifying clays on Mars with Viking, and it was indirect. The Viking lander got to Mars in 76 and started collecting data, and when the scientists first looked at this chemistry data, they said, oh, hey, this looks like there should be clays on Mars. The chemistry seems to fit, and it makes sense. And then there were some issues following that. So let's look in Viking, oops, wrong button here. There we go. Viking, this is a model. This is a replica of Viking that's at JPL, and this is what the scoop looks like. They collected some of the soil and measured chemistry at several spots, and then used this chemical data to try to interpret what kind of minerals are present in the surface. And all of the data that, the, that they looked at, they, they had um, S1 is one of the, the soil results from Viking, and trying to model this, they used analogs they found from several places on Earth, and they used mixtures. And then they measured the chemistry and mineralogy from these mixtures and analogs when they tried to figure out what this material might be on Mars. And at this time, in the mid-'70s, all of the analogs required a lot of clay in order to understand, in order to achieve the chemistry that they were observing. And they didn't have a way to measure the mineralogy directly. They were just measuring the chemistry. So they, they were looking at about half or about two-thirds of the material as being due to clays. And the, the clays were logical because if you alter volcanic material, you typically get clay. So it's a logical conclusion. And further then, there was something called a Viking-labeled release experiment. There were several biology experiments that were mostly worked on here at NASA Ames up the road. And this, this one Viking-labeled release experiment had some equivocal results. If you talk to Gilbert Levine, he said it was successful, and they identified biology on Mars, but almost anybody else would tell you the opposite. And so scientists started looking at other ways to interpret that data, and there was a group studying certain kinds of clays with iron complexes, and they were able to replicate the biology response with, with those. So that was another sort of verification that clays might be present. These are what some of those data look like. And this is decomposition of a chemical compound called formate. So these are the Viking results. And this was the control. And these were some of these clay analogs that seemed to work well. So moving on towards the 80s and 90s, a lot of scientists, mostly astronomers, were using telescopes and spectral data to look at Mars. And they thought, oh, well, we can detect clays in the laboratory or clays on Earth using reflectance spectroscopy. Maybe we can find them on Mars. If they're really there at 50% or, or two-thirds, then we ought to be able to see them. And so they were looking at the spectra, and there are a couple places where we should see clay bands, and one of them's right here, but they didn't find them. And they looked all over the planet. So all of these ovals are places where the telescopic experiments were looking on the planet. And they didn't find clays. And part of the reason that we understand now is these are huge areas. This is like looking at the state of California or the state of Nevada or the state of Texas. So if you're averaging that entire state and trying to find minerals, 
it's, I mean, on Earth you have the problem with the vegetation, so you'd probably see roads and buildings, cement and, and plants, but if you just had rocks, if you're looking in the desert, still you're averaging a huge area and it would be hard to detect the clays. And so looking at another line of, of data, they, they, the Viking chemistry data was sort of supporting clays, the telescopic data couldn't find it, so they looked, we looked at Martian meteorites. So if we look, there are two of the most famous ones are this meteorite from the Allen Hills 84001 and also the Nakla meteorite. And if you look in detail at these meteorites, you see tiny amounts of carbonates and clays, and they're itty bitty tiny, so almost Everything you see, 99% are these silicates like pyroxene or olivine, and only tiny amounts of clay or olivine, clay or, or carbonate. So that led scientists to say, well, maybe there's some clay, but teeny tiny amounts, not very much. And so we actually had debates in the 90s, and it wasn't quite like our election that we've been experiencing lately, but it, they, they weren't really friendly debates either. So at, at conferences that I remember from the 90s, there were scientists arguing, and the, the fun thing back then was you didn't know the answer. So you could pick any side and debate, you know, because we didn't know. So you could say whatever you wanted to. And, People thought there were a lot of people who thought there were no clays on Mars because we couldn't see them yet, and others were sure there were clays because that's what would make sense. And so we had these these um, loud discussions, and um, because of this, the the people who were going to the field to look at analogs, they sort of developed this this perspective. Oh well, if there are clays in it, it's not a good analog. So let's go try to look for the analogs with no clays. And so we have a lot of research that happened for a couple decades where people, it's really hard to find altered volcanic material with no clays because most of the natural progression is to form clay. So people were looking for these obscure places where the clays didn't form because they thought that was the best analog. And so I was a bit of a loner when I was a graduate student. Everybody else was thinking clays were a bad thing or not a good analog, but Fortunately, I persevered, and so for, for graduate students, if there are any out here, if you think you're on to the right thing, keep going, you know, <laughs> get some more data, maybe you'll be right eventually. So, in the, um, the next decade then, there was a spectrometer called ISM, the Imaging Spectrometer for Mars, and this was a French instrument that flew on the Soviet Phobos II. And this had better resolution. Instead of looking at hundreds of kilometers, now we're looking at 22. And so they, they got a few snapshots, a few images before the thing quit. And what that data showed was that there were some weak bands that were in the right region and perhaps they were due to clays. And so this is one of these maps of this clay type band. So this is Valles Marineris, this giant canyon on Mars. And if you look in this region, there um, across here, there's a little bit increased and here it's a little lower. And now we, we know a little bit more about the mineralogy here, but perhaps there was an increased clay detection here. And at the time, this is very weak, and a lot of scientists weren't convinced, but it was possible evidence. And then the next mission brought something called the thermo thermal emission spectrometer. And this was also looking for mineralogy on the surface, including clay minerals, but it's using different part of the structure. And their resolution jumped down to three to five kilometers, so better. But this instrument has a little bit of a challenge because it's geared more towards rocks and coarse grain minerals, and the fine grain things are a little bit harder to detect. So they didn't find clays. They found kinds of basalt, basaltic andesite, and perhaps altered basalt on the surface. And then we had an or another orbital mission, Mars Express, launched by the Europeans, and Omega's a French spectrometer, and they found oodles of clays everywhere. Everywhere they looked, they found clays using these, these near-infrared spectral bands. And then the following year, um, wait, these are the data. So this, these are some Mars data collected by the Omega instrument, and you can see a band here and a band here, and these bands shift a little bit depending on the crystal structure, and so they match these up with laboratory data. And, this was really confirmed identifications of not just one kind of clay, but several kinds of clay. And then a couple years later, CRISM launched, which is the Compact Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars, 
run by NASA on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this mission was looking, instead of at kilometers, looking at 18 meters. So now we're looking at maybe four data points for this room. So it's a big difference than looking at kilometers. So instead of part of a city, you're looking at uh, your backyard or something in terms of a pixel. So it's much easier to detect. So now there were a lot of studies finding multiple kinds of phyllosilicates. And then we started looking at these phyllosilicates, these clays, in terms of what other minerals were occurring with them that might be indicators for aqueous processes. And then this is an approximate image of the global detections now. So the, the whole clay detection story sort of went up and down in terms of how people came to understand where we are today. And this is, I think, a good reminder for the students from today because the, the students from the last decade only know of the abundance of clays everywhere. And, sort of missed out on the journey towards getting to this point of, of our understanding. So um, looking again at the, the two kinds of spectroscopy, and now that we knew there were clays, we started looking at how to, how to improve our detections and basically improve our spectral libraries. So in order to do a better job detecting these, we need to have more samples in our library that we're using to compare with these. And one of the things that we found is important, besides the clays, it's these sort of protoclays, these amorphous aluminosilicates. So things that also form when volcanic material alters, but they're not quite crystalline en enough to make a clay. So when, uh, how come we didn't measure, how come we didn't detect these clays earlier? So the one reason the near-infrared spectral features are stronger, and we didn't get to this technique until sort of later in the game, and also a lot of the outcrops are small, and so it took us a while to get the, the spectral resolution, the surface spots smaller, and also the abundance is is probably only 50 to 60 percent at a very few locations. It's probably much less. So probably most of the locations are more like 20, 30 percent, which means there's a lot of other stuff. So there's some clays, but there are a lot of other minerals present. So in short, we need better orbital data. We need better data processing, and we need better spectral libraries. We scientists always say, we want more data. We want better toys. So we're always working towards better and newer what's coming next. And so the instruments we use, um, the TIR, TIR thermal infrared emission from orbit, visible near-infrared reflectance, XRD is another mineral in instrument that's on MSL, the rover currently, and Raman is planned for upcoming missions, and also near-infrared is planned for an ExoMars mission that the Europeans are running. So the thermal infrared and the reflectance are are wavelengths that we've chosen for remote sensing based on the radiation from the sun. And so when, when we're collecting these, the radiation source is our sun. We need a surface. So this is the planet, or it can be anything in your laboratory. And then we need a detector. So this can be our eyes. And the way our, our eyes work as a spectrometer, we're, we're detecting red and green and blue and processing that information to give a colored scene of what we see. And these spectro the, the detector on these instruments are looking at, in the case of CRISM, 544 channels. And they're mostly in the infrared, which you can't see. So they're looking at, at wavelengths a little bit longer. But what these do is the, the radiation is shined on the surface. And then where the molecule absorbs, that energy is gone. And then the reflected light comes out. So you have uh, a curve that looks like this. And the peaks are due to the absorptions from your material. And so these are different for the thermal infrared region and the near infrared region. So if you look at a black body from the sun, you have the, the maximum of the solar black body is right about where the visible range is. That's where our eyes are tuned. That's why we see the red, green, blue. And all of these are the atmospheric absorptions. And so we, when we're processing this data, we also have to get rid of the atmospheric absorptions in order to see the surface. And then in this diagram, this is showing emission from a planet. And for example, from Mars or an Earth or Mars type planet, you have radiation from the sun. And then you also have emitted radiation from the planet itself. So depending on how 
big and dense the planet is, it's going to have radiation coming out. So you can use this emitted radiation as your source instead of the sun. So the emitted radiation is sending out the radiation from the planet, and then whatever's absorbed by the molecular vibrations is removed, and what you see is sort of a line with little dips in it. And those little dips are what we look at then. And so the, the two kinds, the thermal emission and the visible near-infrared reflectance, are both used at Mars in order to try to understand if clays are present and also what the other minerals are. So this, for clays, we're primarily using this OH combination band, which happens to be in between a lot of the atmospheric bands. So one of the problems is there are all of these noisy atmospheric bands, and this clay detecting band is fortunately at a good place where we can see it in the window from the atmosphere. So how does this work? I have this little model here. The, this is kind of like a clay model. It's very simplified, but they're, they're tetrahedral sites where you have a silicon and oxygen. So what the thermal infrared is measuring is this part between the silicon and the oxygen and these tetrahedral sites. And you can have this symmetric stretch or asymmetric or the bending. And then you also have this octahedral part at the top where you can have iron or magnesium or aluminum, and it has an octahedral um, an octahedral shape, and you have six then oxygens or OHs, and then what we're looking at is the vibration of this OH band and how it's affected by the metals. So the different metals are going to pull on that bond to a different extent. So it's the, the cations that are next to these bonds and also the shape of the whole structure that's changing what those bands are. So let's go on. Then we, these are examples of the clay structures. So there are a lot of common structures, and they're well known. And so if you look at these, they're tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral layers in some, with water and a sandwich in the middle. And others just have a tetrahedral, octahedral repeating layer with no water. So depending on this structure, they give a different kind of a spectral fingerprint. So that a lot of these lab studies have been investigating that. and providing us the lab data that we need in order to identify these from orbit. And so looking at emission and near-infrared studies, we're, we've been working independently on a lot of studies, and then more recently together. One of the problems with NASA missions is they, there's a great competition for which instruments get to be on the mission. Some of you may have heard about this or maybe proposing your own instruments. and. It's often the teams try to, it's kind of like our politicians. Oh, mine is better. My instrument can do everything. And it's much better than anything else out there. And so if everybody says that, then they all want to prove theirs is better than the others. And so you end up with teams not always working together. So of course, for science to proceed, it's better if the teams are working together and trying to see what can Raman tell us, what can thermal infrared tell us, what can the visible near infrared tell us. And that way, you can work together and get a better story about the mineralogy on the surface. So um, another component of this story, there's a lot, of, a lot of people looking at the spectral features and looking at just where the dips appear, and they're doing what we call Sesame Street spectroscopy. So which one looks like the other? And it's, it's important to understand why. So it, it's, it's a good idea to, to first take a look at where the bands are and say, OK, hey, maybe I have this thing here. and then. Look carefully, do you see two bands? It's always better to have two or three to identify a mineral. If you just have one, usually there are a couple choices. Or there could be a calibration issue, or maybe the analog material you're comparing it to has a contaminant in it. And that's actually happened for Mars. There have been people who have said, oh, I found this great mineral. And it's a really odd one. And everybody kind of looked, are you sure? That's kind of weird. And then when they went back and did a more careful study, they found there was a contaminant in there in their laboratory sample that they were using. And the spectral features from the contaminant happened to be really strong. So that's another thing to be careful with and make sure you understand what you're doing. And so some of the lab studies that I've been involved in have been trying to understand what the features are, not just to say, OK, clay 1 has a band here, clay 2 has a band here. And so the way we do this is to look at clays from certain families that have differences in chemistry. So if you go back to your model and you look at the version that has the aluminum flavor versus the one that has the iron flavor and look at where the bands are, and then you can 
try to understand better, look at the, the fundamental bands. And there's a, a fundamental bend and a fundamental stretch. And then there's an overtone. An overtone means a double of that band and a combination of a bend plus a stretch. So you can look for these overtone and combination bands and compare them to the fundamentals. And then you can be sure that the band you're detecting really is due to the clay you're trying to find and not some contaminant that happens to be in the sample. So this is something I've done with some students and colleagues over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's given me confidence that we're detecting what we want to. And another instrument is x-ray diffraction. And that's more commonly known for mineralogy detections. And this is on, this is called Chemmin, and it's on the MSL rover. And what Chemmin has found more recently, these are the minerals that they've been finding. And then at the bottom, smectite is a kind of clay and amorphous material. So they're finding this smectite clay in about 20% of the samples that they're looking at. And these were in regions that we couldn't even detect clays from orbit. So it's, it's interesting to me that there might be 20% clay in some regions when you get down there on the surface and look at them, either because they were obscured by surface material or the abundance was just too low. So there might be even more clays than we realize across Mars. And then this 30% amorphous component, this is this clay-like or proto-clay kind of material that's poorly crystalline and has a similar chemistry to clays, but just didn't mature long enough. And so let's, let's jump back to the missions and look for a bit at the history of Mars. Missions started in the 60s, and unfortunately, things didn't go well. These are a list of all the missions, and uh, this symbol means it didn't work. So there were a lot of missions, especially from the Soviet Union, and this was a, a US mission, that didn't work. Finally, Mariner 4 worked in 1964. It was a flyby, and it collected some images. And again, in the late 60s, and then in the, in the 70s, oh, there was something interesting. This one that the Soviets launched, they launched this mission. They were trying to go to Mars, but their, their mission, the missile crashed. And this was during the whole Cuban Missile Crisis. And so this led to some tense moments where the politicians were like, what are the Russians doing? Oh, no. <laughs> and they were just trying to launch to Mars. And they weren't trying to attack us or Cuba or anybody else. So um, some of, that could have gone really bad, but it, it didn't, so fortunately. The, um, in the 70s, we then had some more success. There was a Soviet mission and Mariner that, that uh, worked for short times. And then Viking um, 1 and Viking 2 in the 70s worked really well for a long time, collected a lot of data. And then our success rate improved. There were still some successes, some failures. And there were a lot of comic strips then. Maybe you've seen some of these. Come now, stop playing Polar Lander, wash your hands, supper's ready. And these guys. This one's going to be harder to catch. It's got wheels. So this is the beagle, unfortunately, that didn't make it. And there'll be uh, some new comics for the, the European mission that didn't make it last week, too. So I, um, I haven't seen any yet, but I'm sure there are some to come. So these are some of the more recent missions. MAVEN is also flying, and the Europeans have an orbiter and, and the lander that didn't work out. So, so there are a lot of missions. and. A lot of successes, but it's not easy. So, um, so that's been a challenge. Going forward, I wanted to talk a little bit about reflectance spectroscopy. This has been the most successful for clay detections. And so we have Omega from Mars Express and CRISM for, from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And again, this is the global detection from a couple years ago. Currently, our map isn't really expanding in terms of globally where it's occurring, but we're refining the kinds of clays and the other aqueous minerals that are detected with them. And what's important about the clay detections is clays basically mean water. So NASA is really interested in knowing where's the water on Mars and where are the locations that could be habitable, that could be supporting astrobiology. And so clays are a good indicator for that, as are sulfates and carbonates and some other minerals. But clays are the most abundant of these. And so that's where our search has led. This is sort of a timeline that was developed by Jean-Pierre Biebring. And this represents the, sort of the new thinking since the detection of all of these, these clays and other aqueous minerals, that the early days on Mars were the time when these clays formed, followed by a time when water was less common. And that's the sulfate time period. And then since then, it, the planet's been fairly anhydrous. 
And so another model that I developed was this one where we think of the early time of the planet being wet and clays forming and other aqueous minerals. And then since then, we don't have water on the planet anymore, but we have these minerals, the aqueous minerals, they're, they're present below the surface. So we've been able to use impact craters as our sort of road cut. There are no tractors making roads and leaving nice road cuts that the geologists use on Earth. Instead, we have to use impact craters. So where these impact craters have thrown up material, we can, they've excavated for us, and we can look and, in some cases, find these clays or sulfates in these impact craters. And so how does CRISM work, then? CRISM is an visible near-infrared spectrometer, and we're looking at a scene like this, and then there are 544 channels. So for each spot on the surface, it's not just a picture. There's, this spot has 544 channels. And so for each pixel is what they call the, each, each pixel, each location in the, in the image has something like these curves. So if it's the blue and the red and the green are examples here of the different kinds of minerals. So I call it a spectral signature or a spectral fingerprint. So you can measure these in the laboratory or in the field, and you can see where the peaks are and what the shape is and use these, these different bands or peaks in order to identify minerals. And so that's what we're doing. And this is the, the planet Mars, and this is a map from a few years back of what the CRISM images look like. So because the resolution is higher, the spots are smaller. If you're looking at 18 meters instead of three kilometers, you're not going to have giant images. Instead, you have little 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer spots. And in the past, that might have been one giant pixel, but now you're going to have thousands of pixels, but each, each little targeted spot is tiny across the planet, which means we have gaps. So we're trying to map where to go collect this data based on where we think we see aqueous features or where we think there's promising data. And this shows what the resolution on the surface will do for you. This is some avarice data from Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And so CRISM runs at a, a low resolution on the surface mode of 200 meters per pixel or 100, and they collect these multispectral strips. And what this shows is if you run across a volcano and see some aqueous outcrops, you'll still know that there's some minerals of interest. But it's hard to reconcile where those outcrops are. You can tell they're there. But as you improve the resolution to something like CRISM today, then you can really see where those outcrops are and try to map the detection of the different minerals with the geology. So you can try to actually say, is it part of the volcano, or is it part of the crater, or is it part of a riverbed or a delta? And that's the kind of question we're trying to answer. So one of the studies I did recently with Liz Rampey from Johnson Space Center is looking at CRISM and test data together and adding some nanophase, these, these protoclase, these nanophase aluminosilicates called allophane and amogalite. So if we add these into the mix, then we were able to understand the phyllosilicates much better. So this, we looked at this area called Marth Vallis, which has one of the largest clay outcrops. And here's some, some data from from this area. There's the southern part of Mars has a lot of impact craters, and the northern part is, is lower and sort of dust covered. And there are a lot of questions about this dichotomy. And Marth Vallis lies at this location, which makes it perhaps more interesting to have a, some information from both the lowland, the, the northern lowlands and the southern highlands where these craters are. So this is one of the images. You could see the, the layered materials and differences in the colors. These clay units in this area are about um, 10 to 50 meters thick at the top of aluminum-rich clays and 50 to 200 meters thick of iron-rich clays. So we can see giant exposures of clays, and we see differences in the chemistry. So early on, we, we started mapping these clays and overlaying them on the MOLA topography, which is approximate. And this is enhanced. But this shows you the, the colors here. We, we map different clays in different colors. So in this view, the red is an iron clay and the blue is an aluminum clay in order to try to see which one is on top or which one is below to understand how the, the minerals were emplaced. 
So looking forward, this is the kind of work that I've been doing recently. This was from my sabbatical in Berlin, and my colleague Christoph Gross has been making these using the German HRSC stereo images from Marth Vellis, and these are prism data. So we're, we found a new way to map five colors on here, and it's really tricky. Using this technique, usually you get three. You get a choice of red, green, and blue, and the choice for the scientist is always really hard. So ah, I only have three choices, and you have to pick which three, and so usually you have this choice of three and this choice of three, and so you have several images of the same thing to try to figure out what's going on. So we found a way to, to actually map these units in five colors, and now we can look at five things at once instead of just three. And so that, that's one, one technique we've been, been doing. And in this study, Liz Rampey and I were looking at a chrism scene where we see this amorphous material and then the aluminum clays and the iron clays. And what we found is the iron clays are in red here. They're the lower part. And the aluminum clays are in the blue in the middle. And the amorphous material is always at the top. And we looked at high-rise detections. Then this is another camera that's on the same mission with CRISM. And high-rise shows close-up views of the surface rocks, so down to 20 or 30 centimeters, or at least a meter in a lot of areas. So we can look with CRISM and see where we see differences in the mineralogy, and then zoom in with high-rise and look at the scene and see do the rocks look different. And we believe they do, and so we're confident that the kinds of materials we're finding here are due to different kinds of, of rocks on the surface. And so these, these are spectra from these different units, and if you, if you look carefully, then you might be able to see these changes. The green and the blue and the red are, are shifted slightly in where the water band and the OH band occur. They're small changes, but they're geographically um, consistent. So then combining the test data, the thermal infrared data to this part of the study, what we found was that the phyllosilics and poorly crystalline materials, we weren't able to detect them well before, but using these new lab samples and field samples in the library, we were able to detect them. And this modeling that Liz did then showed about 30% aliphane and amogalite. This is this amorphous, poorly crystalline phase, and phyllosilicates at 10 to 20 percent. So finally, it seems the, the test data is using a modeling technique in order to understand what's there, whereas the chrism is looking at where the, the band falls, so it's a little bit easier to find the bands right away. But adding this missing component to the model now lets the model find the clays and the, the phyllosilicates in the detection. So, Part of, the pro part of the problem, perhaps, for why the test instrument wasn't finding clays before was that the library might not have been complete. So now that we have more data in the library, we're finding the same story from the near-infrared and the thermal-infrared. So it's, it's kind of helpful, back to our clay structure, if you're looking at this part of the molecule or this part of the clay structure and also this part of the clay structure, it's good if it tells the same story. So that's, that's where we are today, and it's really good to be able to, to say that. So what are the implications for detecting these poorly crystalline phases, the aliphane and some of these others? We're finding these in the top layer at Marth Vallis, and these form in environments where there's a different climate. So where, where these smectite clays form, you tend to have lots of liquid water. That's how these, these smectites form. And the smectite clays are the kind, they're swelling clays, so they stretch and compact, and if most of you probably are from California and you're used to half of year, year, half the year the front door kind of sticks and doesn't open real well, and the other half the back door kind of sticks, and so that's because of the smectite clays, these swelling clays. And so places that form these swelling clays, these smectites, need a lot of water. But the places that form aliphane and amogalite and these poorly crystalline phases don't need a lot of water. It's either poorly drained, uh, it's, it's either a... a a well-drained area, so the water rushes off and is gone, or it doesn't. it's a cold environment like Antarctica, or there isn't much rain. And so what this is telling us about this area on Mars is that first we have layers of clays that need lots of water, and then at the transition, at the end of this sort of clay profile, at the top we're seeing this material that needs less water or where the water is no longer standing. So it's probably a climate indicator for us on Mars. <clears throat> 
So one of the, the project I'm working on now is where we see this new doublet. It's, it's a band that's different than something in our mineral libraries. And so it's been puzzling. Initially, whenever you find something new, you usually think, ah, oh, it's a calibration issue. OK, go back and work on your calibration some more. And if, if this strange feature persists, and you still don't have it in your library, then you have to think, oh, well, how could this for? Maybe it's some kind of alteration. So we, we started thinking about different kinds of acid alteration or mixtures of minerals that might form this. And we've been looking through our libraries and, and trying to find matches that might be consistent. So there's a sulfate called jerosite, and it could be mixed in with some of the clays to give this, or it could be acid alteration. So these, are, these bands, we see this doublet here, where these gray bands are, instead of just one band near 2.2 or one band near 2.3, we're tending to see this doublet sort of sandwiched in between these two instead. And we, we see this in a few isolated pixels. And what I'm going to show you here, ah. Um, in these views, we have the, the blue is the aluminum clay, and the red is the iron clay, and the, the green are these doublet type phases, and in this last image also. So what, in this, in this view and this view, these green spots tend to have this doublet, and so they're sandwiched in between these two primary clay units. So we've looked in, in detail and tried different color views to try to see this in better detail, and we've been finding always that the, the doublet unit is in between the other clay units. So we think, there's a transition along the way from the iron clay to this doublet unit, which might have been formed in acidic conditions, to the aluminum type unit. And this is, again, the five color view, which we started looking at. So we're now looking at the poorly crystalline allophane type unit, the aluminum phyllosilicates, this doublet unit, and then a ferrous chloride unit, and a ferrous is iron too, and a ferric clay. So we're looking at at those transitions. And here are the spectra. So hopefully you agree, even if you're using the, spec the Sesame Street spectroscopy method, which one looks like the other, that maybe everybody can see that these five look different. So that's the main point here. And we've assigned these to different layers then in the stratigraphy using high-rise data and HRSC data. And we've put together what we think happened in terms of the clay formation. And so now we're trying to understand why the, why the, the iron changed from the iron 3 to iron 2, which is a redox case. And a lot of people thinking about astrobiology and habitability say, oh, that could be an energy source whenever you have a change in chemistry like that. And then when you have these are sort of neutral forming clays to this doublet material appears to be more of an acidic kind of environment, and then back to possibly more neutral, but still, so this could be very acidic and this could be mildly acidic. And then at the top is the change in climate to where we don't see a lot of liquid water. And these are some of the textures of these five units that we see, and we're convinced that these do indeed look like different units. And trying to use then all the different parameters, we've been testing several different ones with CRISM to try to map out the, these features compared to each other and really convince ourselves that we're seeing these five different units. So we've been trying a lot of different parameters and seem to see consistent results across this area. So sort of in summary then, we see aqueous alteration at Marth Vallis. We see common phyllosilicate stratigraphy. Most of the clays were formed a long time ago on Mars, about four billion years ago. That's when liquid water was thought to be present. And in order to, to form 200 meters thick clay layers. Probably a lot of water was present. And there, there's actually a whole group of people who think clays were important in the formation of life on Earth. So there's this book, Clay Minerals and the Origin of Life. And so clays work as a, as a reaction template. In industry, the, the clay layers form sort of a tabletop and they're reactive, and so they can grab organic molecules. So some companies use this actually to synthesize organic reactions. So this could have been helpful for formation of life on Earth or possibly on Mars as well, if life ever evolved there. So that's another reason to be looking for clays. And so looking at the mineral, mineralogic record, we see multiple aqueous geochemical conditions. 
So in the Marth Vallis area in particular, long-term and widespread nontronite smectite formation. This is the high water rock ratio, lots of standing water, probably warm. And then we see a changing redox conditions to form the iron two material. And usually on Earth, when you see iron three, iron two changes, that change is facilitated by microbes. And on Earth, we have microbes everywhere. It's really difficult to find a spot where there aren't any. So whenever you have redox type changes, usually that's fostered by, by microbes. And on, on Mars, we have the advantage of time. So we don't need to rush things. So there might, there might not have been microbes on the surface or anywhere on the planet, but there could have been. So the places to look for those might be places where we see these change in redox conditions. And then this acid leaching environment to form this strange doublet feature, we're still looking into this. There's some places in Australia, some acidic sort of small lakes, ponds, where jarosite is forming together with gypsum, which is thought to be more of a neutral mineral. But if you have high chlorine levels, then you can get both jarosite and gypsum, which are two sulfate minerals that could possibly give you these. And on Mars, we have high sulfur and high chlorine, and so the, these regions in Australia have been interesting analog sites to look for a place where you can form the clays we observe and some jarosite and gypsum together. So that's something that more scientists are interested in these days. So there's a transition from neutral conditions and high water rock ratio uh, to form the aluminum phyllosilicates and opal. And then at the top, this well-drained system to form aliphane and amogalite. So we see changes in the aqueous geochemical environment and plausible formation environments, pedogenesis could be a process, hydrothermal processes from if you have a cold environment and then an impact or volcanism, it could heat up the permafrost and melt that to have liquid water, that's possible. And also there could be acidic alteration either from volcanism or wet dry cycling. If you, if you have sort of standing water and it evaporates, then the salts kind of are left behind. So like the the ocean water on Earth is pretty salty, and on, on Mars, perhaps the water could have been a little bit salty as well because there are some sulfate outcrops. So as you have wet dry cycling where this salty water dries up, then that could increase the concentrations of chlorine and sulfur. So environmental changes over time, volcanic ash deposition and alteration, there could have been long-term and widespread nontronite smectite formation under warm and wet conditions changing redox conditions, changing pH conditions, and subsequent de de deposition of fresh volcanic ash. Volcanism isn't occurring on Mars today, but during the early part of its history, there was. So four billion years ago, the planet was pretty active. We had water, we had impacts, we had volcanism. It was a pretty happening place. So at that time, that's when a lot of these interesting minerals were forming as well. So back to the history of phyllosilicates on Mars, we had decades of discussion and disagreement, which is good in a lot of sense. If everybody agrees, then it's kind of boring and there might be not as much science going on. So it's good to have a little disagreement and that fosters more thought and more discussion and more research. And the last decade has brought about confirmation of multiple kinds of phyllosilicates across, um, across the planet and by numerous researchers. So now CRISM studies are, the visible near-infrared region is leading the insights into early geochemical environments. And these, there are hundreds of sites where clays have been identified and other aqueous minerals together with them. And also MSL, the, the MSL is the rover that's currently active at Gale Crater. And this has an X-ray diffraction instrument and it's detecting about 30% of this amorphous protoclay material and about 20% clay in some places as well. So what do we need? Careful lab work to support the remote sensing. And also, I think we need the power of coordinating multiple remote sensing data sets. The more we can work together with different instruments, the more powerful our results in terms of understanding the mineralogy. And so what's going on for the future? Near-infrared imaging spectrometer is planned for, ExoMars, for the ExoMars rover, a micro omega. And there's ground truthing to provide for omega and chrism. So a lot, of, a lot of scientists are doing analog studies on Earth in order to understand what those orbital data are telling us. And there will be Raman planned for the Mars 2020, the NASA rover, and also the ExoMars rovers. So hopefully adding Raman spectroscopy to these other techniques will enhance our knowledge. So far, we haven't sent Raman there, and 
Raman has been a challenge in some cases, detecting clays and iron oxides, but hopefully if we work together with multiple, unit, multiple instruments, we can build a better framework and understand this data better. And that is the end. So thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, I'm going to take the prerogative to uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, so the primary message that these clays are telling us is that the rocks that you're looking at have been altered by water. Is, is that, that about the size of it? That's the main um, thing, yes. To what extent do you know or have an opinion about whether that water was standing water like lakes or seas or oceans or just a temporary stream that maybe flowed across the surface long enough to alter the rock and then went away again? I think we have both. So where we see these, these thick beds of, of some of these clays, especially the spectite, the swelling ones that disrupt your doors in your house, this kind need a lot of water and probably warm water. And there's sort of a balance because everybody's wondering, well, how warm was Mars? And if it was pretty cold, it would have, the water would have had to have been there for a long time. But if that water was warmer, then it could have been present for a shorter time. So that, there's kind of a balance there in terms of how long the planet would have had to have been warm. So if it was hotter, um, like a hot bathtub, then it probably could have been a shorter time period. But if it was pretty cold liquid water, it might have taken a longer time. But the water, usually where we see channels, where there, there's evidence of liquid water flowing, like deltas or valleys, we don't often see clays forming in that area because it's probably cold water and probably transient. So we probably needed to have standing water sort of like lakes and ponds and rain in order to form a lot of these, the thick deposits that we see, so. Okay. Um, the other thing, I noticed when you put up the global map of where clays had been detected, it looked like they were, from my limited knowledge of Martian geography, it looked like they were uh, focused on the highlands and not the northern basin and not the Hellas basin. Is that? A, That's true. Is yeah. that a observation bias, or does that tell us where the clays are forming, or does that tell us where the clays are being exposed, or is it something else? It's probably a little bit of all, all of that. So part of it is um, Hellas and Isidus, and the northern plains have a lot of dust. Mm -hmm. So um, if the surface is covered with dust, you can't see through it to the surface. So then we need impact craters or something to get the surface material up and then we can sometimes see through that. So where there's dust and sand, we can't really detect the surface. But also, it looks like it's more than just that. There, there are places in the northern plains where the craters have excavated the material, and they're thinner, weaker clay deposits. And we see the abundant thick ones tend to be in the southern part. So there, it seems that both, we're seeing it better, and we're able to see the rocks better in the south but we, where we do have the exposures, we see thicker, wider. Like in the Marth Vallis area, it's like thousands of kilometers. It's huge where we see. So it's a lot. And so for the north, we're seeing tiny little thin layers of clays where the impacts have excavated it. But it's on the order of kilometers, not thousands of kilometers. OK. So. Other questions? Janet, so um, if there hasn't been any water or volcanism on the surface for a long time, how do you know that the water wasn't there uh, a billion years ago versus four billion years ago? How do you know how long it's been since then? There are people who do crater counting, and they're, mostly this work started with the moon, but it's now been, uh, it's now been performed on, on Mars as well. And, there's a technique, especially in, it's developed by the group in Berlin that I've been working with, and they, they count the density of craters of different sizes. And so they're looking at the terrain, and they can tell by the density of these craters how old the terrain is. And so there, we know that most of the areas where these clay outcrops are, most of them are about 4 billion years old. And there's some, I mean, that's sort of the model that was developed. But then maybe 10 to 20 percent were formed at these later epochs. But it's not really recent. Most of the rest of them were formed in the Hesperian period on Mars, which was maybe 3.5 to 3.8 billion years, so still really ancient. And then only a very few sporadic outcrops appear to be young, so young being maybe one or two billion years old. And those are the really 
question mark ones where it's like, oh, well, how could you have enough water to form clays a billion, a billion years? This should have been this desert climate that we've had for so long. So how did those clays form? And those are some of the big questions. It, did it just excavate something or remobilize something? Or was there really enough water in this one site? And maybe there was some geothermal energy that, that perhaps melted some ice or formed uh, small little ponds or areas, isolated regions that could have been wet enough to form, form these clays. Otherwise, it's been really a desert environment, sort of like Antarctica, but much more extreme for the past probably three billion years. <clears throat> now, you talk about a warmer Mars possibly early on. Now, would that have been due to greenhouse gases or late heavy bombardment or radioactivity um, before it decayed down? What? I think those are all good thoughts. So there, yeah. a lot of the um, Earth was, was warmer also, and there was... Sometimes we look at Earth and Mars together in terms of how the planets formed because they're sort of sisters and nearby. And we see Mars today, and we see that the atmosphere is very thin mm -hmm. and it's very cold. And yeah. there are models that try to explain how the planet could yeah. have ever been warm, and it's difficult. There, there's the, there's a big dichotomy there in our understanding because the modelers are saying. We can't find a model that makes sense to give us a warm planet. But the, the geomorphology specialists look at the surface, and they see valley networks, and they see features that look like crater lakes. And they, they see evidence for f water on the surface. And then the mineralogy is saying, we see evidence for standing water, for long-term standing water to form these minerals. So we still don't have agreement here. And so the, the how long, how wet, how warm is, is still a question, but all of those things, the, the, the planet's interior heat, geothermal heat, impact volcanism, there, so there are a lot of, a lot of potential sources. But um, how to explain that with the atmosphere, we, we still have some challenges there. During so much, much time, the surface of Mars was, of course, exposed to intense UV radiation, and do you have you seen data or studies where people are studying the photolytic decomposition of water-bearing minerals under intense UV radiation? Because not all the OH bands uh, look like they would look on terrestrial minerals. That, that's something back in the days when the, there was skepticism about the presence of clays. That was something that we looked into. That maybe these, these OH bands in clays that we use to detect clays, maybe we're not seeing them because the, the mineral structure is disrupted. And you're exactly right that the UV radiation could be one of those that's disrupting the structures. And so you have an, an O and an H, and this is vibrating. But if you've, if you've kicked off the hydrogen, there's nothing to vibrate. So you're not seeing that band then. So that, that could happen. So that, that could be part of the story as well, that those in, in places where those minerals, those clays are on the surface, that bond could be broken because of UV processes Photonics on the surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. There's, oh, okay. Mars has been hit by a lot of meteors yes. and uh, asteroids and such. Can you see deposits that uh, and this is getting a bit away from clays a bit, but but that you would suspect of being uh, results of uh, de deposition of asteroid material uh, as opposed to uh, locally generated stuff. Well, in fact, I think there was a report of a of the rover finding an iron meteorite on the surface. So if you if you look at um, I think it's JPL Mars rover. If you type in those keywords that. It might still be up. It was up in the last week or so. There, it shows the sort of reddish brown surface, and there's this bright, shiny, sort of gray, silver rock. And that's an iron meteorite that they think came. And, and there's some debate about Phobos and Deimos, the planet, the, the moons at Mars. Were these perhaps captured asteroids, or did something whack the planet and then form some new material? So certainly, asteroids hitting the planet was an important part of the early evolution. And, how much that affected the heat or the water, it's hard to say, but certainly asteroid impact was an important part of the history. 
Well, one of the things that people argue is that asteroids and comets would have brought organics. And so this, the MSL that's currently there, the SAM instruments, looking for organics and volatiles. And the theory is there, we should have had these organics brought by the asteroids. And they've had difficulty finding them. So perhaps UV photolysis has destroyed those on the surface. And if the organics are not there, then why are they not there? Maybe there are reactions with iron oxides. Or maybe you know they, they should be there unless they were removed by some process. So that's one of the questions that we're trying to look for. Hey, Janice, thanks. A great talk. Um, so I was just fortunate enough to be with our NAI team, as you know, in the, in the Atacama for a week or so. And one of the places, one of the analog sites we were at was a massive gypsum plane. And uh, that plane had both crystalline and amorphous gypsum. And under the amorphous gypsum, we were more likely to find, you know, cyanobacteria and signs of signs of life. Do we know much about the the, the characteristics of the gypsum planes on Mars, and to what extent they're crystalline or amorphous or or some other uh, uh, composition or some other structure? The the main gypsum outcrops that we see are towards the north of the planet. There's some interesting dunes, Olympia Undae, and. The gypsum that we see from orbit is probably crystalline because we see the nice gypsum. Gypsum has a really characteristic spectral fingerprint. But as the minerals become more amorphous, instead of having repeating crystalline units that have really strong bands, because if you've got 10,000 of these repeating units, you get a nice, sharp, narrow band. But if you have a few, and they're all a little different, that's what happens when it's amorphous, then your bands broaden out and they weaken and it's harder to detect them. And one thing we see on Mars is we see this sort of broad water bands in a couple places and that's probably hydrated amorphous material. And we can't really say, is it hydrated amorphous gypsum? Is it hydrated amorphous ferrihydrite, which is an iron form, or is it is it something like alophane or amoglite, which are more aluminum silica, or is it something like opal, which is only silica? So the chemistry of this hydrated amorphous material is harder to detect. But I think you're right that these amorphous materials have a high surface area. So they're, they're tinier particles, less crystalline with a lot of surface area. So those are perfect for microbes to hide in and sit on the surfaces of. They're more more surfaces, and it's easier for them to access the material because if a microbe has to remove elements from a crystalline material, it takes more energy. So if there's an amorphous material or poorly crystalline, it's a, a much easier food source for microbes to be trying to gain energy. So that's a good analog site. And a, a lot of people go to these deserts, either cold deserts like the Antarctic Dry Valleys or in Chile, where the, the radiation is high, it's very dry, and you still find microbes there. So it's really hard to find a place on Earth that, despite all of the extreme conditions there, there's usually always some, some microbes present as well. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, this question got answered a little bit maybe with the last answer, but you're, you were saying that uh, spectral libraries are very useful. Is there any use in populating those theoretically? Uh, building, sort of building them up from the building blocks of the, of the analog that you mix, or yes, I, I think that would be a good tool. So far, we've mostly been using pure minerals, but it's very difficult to find pure minerals sometimes. So that's one of the challenges. And then sometimes you you know, okay, well we have a, a set of the pure form of the iron or the magnesium. What about the calcium form, or what about the you know aluminum form, a different a different form? And using synthetic minerals and synthetic theoretical in that regard would probably be helpful. And it's very difficult, I think, to, to calculate that. But as we expand our pure, our knowledge of the pure minerals, I think that would be helpful. And another reason that could be helpful is for modeling, because nowhere on any planet are you going to have 100% of any mineral. So everything's a mixture. And so what, what we're trying to do now in the laboratory is mix 10% of this, 20% of that, 50% of this, another 20% of that, I think gives 100, if that, <laughs> my math was right. In any case, the, you're preparing these mixtures in the laboratory to see how the grains mix, and it depends on the optical properties of each mineral and on the grain sizes. And so as we do some of these lab studies, we understand that better, and then we can do more of these theoretical studies. But I think that's, that's probably an area for the future. Maybe there'll be some 
um, some graduate students coming along who are going to be gifted in that area and help fill in another leap forward in our detection. All right. Well, as we often do, I am here to present Janice with the SETI Talk mug as a token of thanks. Thank you. And let's congratulate All her right. on the prize she received and thank her for a very interesting talk. Thank you, everyone.